I'd like to call the order of the um, afternoon session of, for Friday um, the 13th of the Speech, Language, Pathology, and Audiology and Hearing Aid Dispensers Board. I think we should call roll to make sure everybody is here. Um, Holly Kaiser? Here. Todd Borges? Here. Karen Chang? Here. Gilda Dominguez? Here. Debbie Snow? Here. Amy White? Here. And I'm here. I'd like to ask if there are any members of the board staff or, or administration who would like to um, introduce themselves. Paul Sanchez, board executive officer. Michael Canotes, legal counsel. Sharice Burns, assistant executive officer. Heather Olivares, legislation and regulation analyst. Okay. Um, all right, we're going to move on to agenda item 13, legislative report, update, review, and possible action on proposed legislation. Um, so I would like to turn it over to Heather Olivares. Thank you, Heather. Good afternoon, board members. Um, I prepared a report for you um, with some legislative deadlines that have recently passed and are upcoming. Um, and then we'll follow with some bills that we'll be taking an active position um, on and uh, a bill we may be changing our position on and then some watch bills. So first up is the legislative calendar and deadlines. Um, recently on May 6th, the last day for policy committees to hear bills introduced in their house of origin passed. And then upcoming on May 20th is the last day for fiscal committees to hear bills introduced in their house of origin May 27th is the last day for bills to be passed out of the House of Origin. July 1st is the last day for policy committees to hear bills. And then the legislature will go on a recess for most of July from the 2nd to the 31st. And then they'll reconvene in the beginning of August and there will be the last day for fiscal committees to hear bills on August 12th. So the first bill we are going to be recommending for a position is AB 1733 regarding state bodies open meetings. Um, this bill is dead for the year. Um, however, we are still recommending the board adopt a support position um, to register our general support for this hybrid meeting model. Um, so what this bill would do is require open meetings to provide members of the public with a physical location to hear, observe, and address the state body and means to remotely hear or hear and observe the meeting and remotely address the state body without requiring public comments to be submitted prior to the meeting. This bill would allow board members to remotely participate in an open meeting without disclosing the remote location. However, the board would be required to end or adjourn the meeting if the means of remote participation fails during the meeting and cannot be restored. The board's recommended position is support because this bill would facilitate opportunities for members of the public to attend board meetings by providing both a physical location and a teleconference option. This bill would also allow board members to attend the meetings from a remote location via teleconference without requiring the location to be closed or open to the public. This, this bill may result in cost savings to the board for meetings with a physical location in Sacramento and all board members attending remotely for a cost of approximately $1,100 per meeting. Are there any questions about this bill? Can you can you remind us of the history of why we had why we have to um, state where we're located, where we have to publish that address, and okay. why it's okay to eliminate that now? So current law um, requires for teleconference meetings that um, wherever a board member is physically located, that member has to um, have their location be accessible to the public, and it needs to be published on the agenda 
um, and uh, announced at the beginning of the meeting what that location is. Um, so that is already current law and it has been a challenge um, for a number of boards, including ours, to find locations that aren't too noisy yet still accessible to the public and they need to be ADA compliant and there's a lot of rules around what that location has to be and it can often be challenging to find um, locations um, that meet all the requirements and so this bill will allow those board members to still be remote, but because the board will be having an online platform like we are for this meeting, we're current you, currently using WebEx, um, it will allow people all throughout the state to access the business of the board um, as well as members to um, also work remotely and still participate in the meeting. Wouldn't they still be able to do that and publish their location? There's nothing that prohibits a board member if they want their location to also be open to the public. There's nothing in this bill that prohibits that from happening. It just allows it to not have to be published. So we, there's nothing that says we can't make our meetings even more accessible than this law would require, um, but it is addressing issues that we have had in the past where w um, we couldn't necessarily always find a public location. And there, if, on the, by the same token, if every board member wanted to attend physically, there's no prohibit, prohibition Correct. of that. Yes, this is just, um, it's addressing the issue that we've kind of faced during the pandemic where um, we had to meet uh, remotely it is putting practices we've already adopted over the past two years into um, law to allow this hybrid format to continue. I want to go ahead and chime in here. Um, so I, I've also had the experience. So during the pandemic, obviously, you could have logged in from your home and we would not want to publicize your home location. So that was during the pandemic. But we had a waiver for that due to the executive order. Um, but you know, pre-pandemic, we've also had, depending on the location, it's, it's extremely difficult if you're in San Francisco per se, um, depending on your resources or where you work, you may not have an open place you can have it at where the public can come on in. So we've had to work with uh, Department of Justice to use one of their rooms. It turns out that room didn't have a phone. So there was all kinds of interesting, weird issues that become part of it to make it publicly noticed, it has to be available via audio and then also ADA accessible. So sometimes we just run into those issues in certain locations um, for board members. Um, this would instead say, well, if, if that's all going to be too difficult, you just need to log into the WebEx and we don't have to put your location on there. If say, I don't know, you work in a regional center or you're going to log in from home or you work in a facility where it's locked to the public, say if you worked in a prison or something like that, you obviously can't publish your location and allow everybody to come on in to have the meeting. Um, so it just allows us more options. Um, it does have some provisions of the bill that require audio and visual. And visual. Um, and we've decided to continue with the WebEx to continue to get more engagement from stakeholders, which we saw during the pandemic. So we're already trying to implement the hybrid meeting as well. But as, as we've noticed, we have to put that location where any remote board members are at. So it does make it have to be a public and ADA accessible mm -hmm. instead of being able to log in from your home or a private office or something like that. But if we don't end up saving $1,100 per meeting, is that okay? Well, yeah, it's part of the cost of doing business. I have a question. Does this basically mean that uh, board members in Southern California wouldn't need to travel to Northern California for the board meetings and vice versa? It could. I believe under this bill, we would just have, have to have one physical location, which could be the board and Paul and I and staff and Michael could be in the Sacramento office with our webcam and, and audio up. Um, and then we would be projecting from there. People could show up if they wanted to. Everybody else could log in. You wouldn't even have to drive in if you're local. Um, so it kind of increases the options for you. 
um, rather than restricting it to only publicly noticed, only at those locations. But if we wanted to still come travel and actually be here in person, that would be an acceptable choice. Yes, and it will not prohibit you from doing so. Okay. Yeah, nothing in this bill requires us to have to all be remote. We can have everyone in Sacramento, for example, like we are here for the most part, um, aside from our one remote location this meeting. Um, but having our stakeholders all across the state. And um, one of the benefits behind this legislation is a number of boards have seen increased stakeholder participation in their meetings without all these stakeholders that are located throughout our vast state having to travel to Sacramento for a meeting they can attend wherever they are. So one, one final point of contrast between what would occur in this bill and the current teleconference rules is say we had all members participating from teleconference locations. Those have to be in the agenda 10 days before the meeting. If they change and you can't access that location, we got to cancel the whole meeting. If in the middle of the meeting, one of those locations has technical difficulties, goes down, we have to adjourn the meeting and we can't have any more business. So, so that, that, that's another, that, that's, one of the major limitations of the current teleconference rules. Okay, is there any other board discussion? Any public comment here in the, in the room? Seeing none, I'd like, it, like to open for public comment via WebEx. We are now open for for public comment via WebEx, if you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial-in users, please dial star three to raise your hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. Let's take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comments, would you like to move to Ms. Dominguez? Yes, please. And no one is uh, present with me for public comment. Okay, now we need to go back. I guess there is a motion to um, accept support for this yes, budget. If the board decides to move forward with the support, we would need to have a motion that the board adopt a support position on AB 1733. So I don't think there, I don't think we have a motion yet. We don't. Um, so that's what she's. Yeah. If you would like to adopt a position, that's what the motion would need to say. I motion to adopt a position in support of this, in support of AB one seven three three. I second mm -hmm. it. Okay. We've already asked for public comment there, isn't it? There wasn't before. Do you want to ask again? Is, do we need to? We, do have to? we really should for when okay. we're taking action for a motion. All right. Uh, is there any other discussion here publicly in the in the room? If not, we're going to open Web, WebEx one more time for public comment. We are now open for public comment via WebEx. If you would like to make a comment on the motion, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial in users, please dial star three to raise your hand. And we will call on people in the order we have requests. I think you could do it at the end of the whole report if you want. Can I? That would be great. There's a motion for each one. And I think that is the case here. Seeing no yeah, request for comments, would you like to move to Ms. Dominguez? Yes, please. There is no one present with me for public comment. Okay, if there isn't any uh, board discussion, um, I'd like to ask Sharice to call the vote. Dr. Raggio? Aye. Ms. Kaiser? Aye. Mr. Borges? Aye. Ms. Chang? Aye. Ms. Dominguez? Aye. 
Ms. Snow? Aye. Dr. White? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, the next bill um, for discussion and the possible adoption of a position is AB 2686, um, which is the board's sunset bill. Um, I just saw this morning that the bill has been scheduled for the Assembly Appropriations Committee on May 18th. This bill would extend the board's sunset date until January 1, 2027 and make other clarifying changes. This bill would authorize an appointing authority to remove a board member from office at any time. This bill would require applicants and licensees to provide the board with their email address by July 1, 2023 and notify the board of any changes within 30 days. This bill would also expand the reasons for which the board is authorized to take disciplinary action including providing the board with explicit authority to enforce any violations of Business and Professions Code Section 650, which prohibits licensees from offering or receiving consideration in exchange for patient referrals. The board staff is recommending the board formally adopt a support position on this bill um, because it would ensure the continued existence of the board until January 1, 2027, and would make a number of clarifying and technical amendments requested by the board in our sunset report. This bill would also provide the board with authority to require applicants and licensees to provide their email address, which will allow the board to quickly and efficiently communicate new information. And as we discussed earlier in our sunset report update, um, the executive officer and assistant executive officer are still working closely with committee staff to include the additional um, legislative changes that the board included in the sunset review, the report. And that won't negate support at this point for the bill? Correct, we should adopt support um, on the bill as it currently stands and our position of support will remain until the board decides to adopt another position at a future board meeting. Any board discussion? Seeing none, can we have a motion to Support. Do you want to restate it, Heather? Sure. So we would need a motion for the board to adopt support position on AB 2686. I, I move the board um, have a, provide a support p p position on AB 2686. I second. Is there any um, public comment here in the room on this? Motion or this issue? Seeing none, can we open um, for public comment via WebEx? We are now open for public comment via WebEx. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial in users, please dial star three to raise your hand and we will call on people in the order we have requests. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, would you like to move to Ms. Dominguez? Yes, please. No one is present with me for public comment. Okay, thank you. There's no further board discussion. I'd like to ask Sharice to call the vote. Dr. Raggio. Aye. Ms. Kaiser. Aye. Mr. Borges. Aye. Ms. Chang. Aye. Ms. Dominguez. Aye. Ms. Snow. Aye. Dr. White. Aye. The motion carries. The next bill is AB 2806 regarding child care and developmental services in preschools, expulsion and suspension, mental health services, the reimbursement rate. This bill has not been scheduled in the Assembly Appropriations Committee. This bill would require specific actions to be taken, including engaging an early childhood mental health consultant prior to unenrolling or expelling a child from a family child care 
home education program or preschool due to a behavior issue. This bill includes a provision that would authorize a person with at least a master's degree in speech and language pathology to receive reimbursement for early childhood mental health consultation services. Um, this is similar to a bill that we looked at last year. The board staff is recommending an opposed unless amended position as the bill is currently written. Um, because although speech language pathologists serve on multidisciplinary teams to provide services to children with disorders of speech, voice, language, or swallowing, the provision authorizing a person with at least a master's degree in speech and language pathology to receive reimbursement for early childhood mental consultation services is problematic. Specifically, this bill does not require the person to hold a valid CTC credential or license, only that they have at least two years of experience working with children zero to five years in addition to their master's degree. This bill, the board should request amendments that these services can only be provided by a licensed or credentialed speech language pathologist and the board may also wish to specify that they must be practicing within their scope of practice. Can I just ask what the mechanism is for the board to, um, to give that feedback to the author? So we would submit, um, after the um, position is adopted of opposed unless amended, we would submit uh, what's called a position letter to the author's office and committee staff um, we would outline what our concerns are and we would tailor it specifically to our concerns are only germane to the aspect of the um, speech language pathologist um, involvement and we would request um, what the amendments would be and I would actually draft up um, sample amendments that would be acceptable to that for them to consider. Um, and then if those amendments are taken down the line, um, board staff would be able to submit a letter saying we are withdrawing our opposition um, due to our concerns being addressed. Any other board discussion? Okay. Would you like to formulate a, a motion sure. for us? Um, the board is adopting an opposed unless amended position specifically regarding the requirement that speech language pathologists should have a valid license or CTC credential um, and they're adopting a position on AB 2806. I, I move that the board adopt uh, an opposed unless amended position on AB 2806. Second. Um, any just want to oh, just want to clarify that that the um, I think it would be an opposed and less amended position in accordance with the staff's recommendation. So you may want to just 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 stating that for the record. Oh, I thought you did. Uh, no, not the last part. I just the the last part. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, I I move the board. Um, to recommend or to take the um, opposed to unless amended position according to staff's recommendations for AB 2806. Second. Any public comment here in the room? Seeing none, I'd like to ask for public comment via WebEx. We are now open for public comment via WebEx. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial-in users may dial star 3 to raise their hand and we will call on people in the order we have requests. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, would you like to move to Ms. Dominguez? Yes, thank you. No one is present with me for public comment. 
So if there's no further board discussion, uh, Sharice, could you call the vote? Yes. Dr. Raggio? Aye. Ms. Kaiser? Aye. Mr. Borges? Aye. Ms. Chang? Aye. Ms. Dominguez? Aye. Ms. Snow? Aye. Dr. White? Aye. The motion carries. The next bill is SB 1031 um, regarding inactive license fees. This bill is currently on the Senate Appropriations Committee suspense file. This bill would require the renewal fee for an inactive license to be half of the amount of the fee for the renewal of an active license unless the board establishes a lower fee. Board staff is recommending a post position because we have multiple concerns with the blanket provisions of this bill. Board staff anticipate approximately 6,700 licensees would choose to be on inactive status, resulting in an estimated revenue loss of $295,000 annually. The board's workload would not decrease if a licensee changes to an active status. For example, all of the license processing tasks would still be required each renewal cycle and normal complaint intake and enforcement measures would not be reduced simply by reducing the cost of an inactive license. Additionally, there is potential for additional enforcement workload related to licensees that are practicing on inactive status due to an error during their license renewal. This bill would create a significant decrease in revenue and would detrimentally impact the board's fund condition without creating a decrease in the board's workload. The board would likely need to significantly increase all the licensing fees to address the deficit caused by this bill. Additionally, board staff have concerns with the arbitrary percentage for the lower inactive license fee without giving adequate consideration to balancing the needs of keeping licensing and application fees as reasonable as possible, while also ensuring the board's operation costs are met without sacrificing consumer protection and licensing services to licensees and applicants. Are there any questions about this bill? Any board discussion? Okay, um, we need to, would you like to formulate this? Sure. The board adopts an opposed position on SB 1031. Do we have to add uh, the board's recommendation or the uh, staff recommendation to that? No, because this one we're not going to propose any amendments. This is going to be oh, a straight the opposed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody? So move. Oppose SB 1031. Second. Any public comment here in the room? <clears throat> Seeing none, I'd like to ask for public comment via WebEx. We are now open for public comment via WebEx. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial-in users may dial star 3 to raise their hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests for comments. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comments, would you like to move to Ms. Dominguez? Yes, please. And there was no one present with me for public comment. Okay, if there's no further board discussion, I'd like to ask Sharice to call a vote. Dr. Raggio? Aye. Ms. Kaiser? Aye. Mr. Borges? Aye. Ms. Chang? Aye. Ms. Aye. Ms. Dominguez? Aye. Dr. White. Aye. Motion carries. Oh, you forgot me. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Ms. Snow. Um, I. <laughs> I think you should say nay this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, the next bill is SB 1453 regarding speech language pathologists and the fees procedure. This bill is currently on the Senate floor. This bill would make changes to the flexible fiber optic transnasal endoscopic procedure, commonly known as the fees procedure. Specifically, this bill would allow a speech language pathologist to perform the fees procedure at a location based on the patient's medical needs without the presence of a physician as long as the facility has protocols for emergency medical backup procedures, including a physician or other appropriate medical professional being readily available. This bill would also remove the requirement that an ear, nose, and throat doctor, commonly referred to as an ENT, authorize the fees procedure and instead allow a speech language pathologist to perform the fees procedure upon the orders of a licensed physician. This bill would prohibit the fees procedure to be performed on patients who have contraindications to the procedure. Additionally, this bill would clarify that a speech language pathologist must perform 25 supervised fees procedures and obtain written verification from one ENT that they are competent to perform the procedure. Uh, board staff is not recommending a formal position on this, um, but rather um, recommending the board have a discussion to formulate a position. Board staff receive a number of inquiries from licensees regarding uncertainty with the requirements for the fees procedure. This bill would provide clarity to licensees regarding the requirements to obtain written verification of competency, who must authorize the fees procedure, and whether a physician must be present during the procedure. This bill would allow the fees procedure to be performed in locations based on the patient's medical needs without the presence of a physician, as long as the facility has protocols for emergency backup procedures, including a physician or other appropriate medical professional being readily available. However, emergency medical backup procedures, other medical professional and readily available are not defined in statute or regulation, leading to a potential lack of clarity regarding this provision. The board may wish to consider requesting amendments to require the provisions of the bill to become effective at a later date to, the, to provide the board with time to develop regulations to provide clarity to this provision. <coughs> Board staff are concerned that it could be potentially harmful to consumers to create a situation where the fees procedure could be done at locations without, with inadequate medical backup procedures and without appropriate medical professionals due to the lack of specificity in the statute. Board staff recommend a delayed effective date of a minimum of 18 months to allow the development of regulations based on the amended statute. Additionally, this bill would specify contraindications to the fees procedure, but ASHA also identifies additional contradiction, contraindications, including severe movement disorders, severe bleeding disorders, and recent trauma to the nasal cavity. The board may wish to discuss amendments to add additional contraindications to the fees procedure into the bill language. The board may also wish to consider requesting amendments that include a reporting requirement to ensure that adverse events that occur during a fees procedure are reported to the board, as current law does not require locations outside of health facilities to be reported to the Department of Public Health or another appropriate licensing board. Board staff have reached out to a number of stakeholders to gather information regarding the fees procedure to improve our understanding of the procedure. There are various opinions among stakeholders regarding the risks involved, the locations where it is safe to perform the procedure, and the emergency backup procedures that should be in place. In addition to the information provided in my legislative report, there are a number of materials including in the included in the board packet to help with the discussion on this bill. 
So we can start with board member discussion and I believe representatives from Kesho um, were also planning to attend this meeting to um, discuss in um, the public comment portion. And I wanted to also state that we have a, a letter from our our public board member who's also an ENT, uh, Dr. Tulio Valdez, that we'll be able to read. I just had a quick question. Under the summary, it says that um, there be other appropriate medical professional being readily available. Is there any definition to readily available? There is not, and that's why um, we are recommending either in statute further defining these terms um, or allowing us time to define it through regulation. My other question is, is does this bill have opposition? It does not have any opposition um, on record at this time. When would it be appropriate to look at uh, Dr. Valdez's comments? Do you want to wait or? We can, we can read it now. Did you want to read it first? I can't hear sure. it. Sure, I can read it. Uh, would you like me word for word? It would be interesting to know what the questions were uh, posed to him and, and then what his responses were. Yes, so uh, I will go about it that route. Uh, so. I think I'll, I'll just go where he starts off. To start, the, the fees procedure in which a flexible endoscope and camera are placed in the nasal cavity and nasopharynx to provide an image of the larynx during swallowing. Uh, in expert hands, this is a safe procedure. However, there can be risks associated with the procedure. He was asked, what are the main risks in the fees procedure? The main risk are the possibility of aspiration of the food by the patient into the lungs, bleeding caused from the scope and vasovagal episodes, which can be risky for cardiac patients. The next question was, would one ENT have time to supervise 25 procedures? Should this provision be amended to specify that 25 fees procedures must be supervised in person by an ENT? And he said, this is an essential requirement for patient protection. Yes, there must be 25 witness scopes supervised by an otolaryngologist, but this does not need to be the same otolaryngologist. Aside from just introducing the scope, there is a need to understand vocal fold mobility and anatomical changes caused by surgery. This is especially true in head and neck cancer patients. He was asked, are there concerns about no longer requiring an ENT to authorize the fees procedure and opening up the authorization from all licensed physicians? And he stated, in some circumstances, the test can be ordered by other physicians, but for patients that have undergone fragile patients where ENT involvement and medical knowledge are necessary. Uh, he was asked, are there concerns with allowing the fees procedure to be done without the supervision of a licensed physician? He said, yes, some patients should be performed only in the presence of a licensed physician, such as a pediatric patient and cardiac patient. He was asked, are there, locate, are there concerns with allowing the fees procedure to be formed at a, performed at a location that is not licensed healthcare setting? And it was, I believe there should be, these should be done in supervised health settings since the patients that need fees usually have comorbidities and there should be uh, physicians on site. Licensed healthcare facilities, the next question was that licensed healthcare facilities usually develop emergency backup procedures. If the fees procedure is going to be performed at private SLP clinics, should emergency backup procedures be further defined or specified? He stated, yes, there should be well-defined emergency backups, defibrillators, management of epi epistaxis, I'm gonna apologize for butchering that, and personnel trained in CPR. This is important since most of the population is of advanced age with a history of multiple comorbidities and on blood thinners for cardiac medications or, or cardiac medications. And then he stated, there must be regulations to protect patients treated at SLP clinics. There should be well-defined emergency backups, defibrillators, management of epistaxis, and personnel trained in CPR as with any other medical procedure, as well as regulations for endoscope cleaning. And then the last question, uh, the bill lists contraindications for the fees procedure, but ASH also identifies severe 
movement disorders, severe bleeding disorders, and trauma to the nasal cavity as contraindications. Should the bill be amended to, to include these contraindications? Yes, as well as recent skull-based surgery or naso nasopharyngeal CA. Cancer. Oh, cancer. Okay. Epistaxis is simply a bloody nose. That's what I was guessing, but I, I keep butchering how to say it. I don't know why I want to call it epitaxis. Epistaxis. What are the uh, subdivisions that he's referring to? Subdivision G1, subdivision G2, what is Oh, those is are the sections from? of the actual Just bill. Just sections of the actual bill? Yeah, okay. in, I, I included the bill language um, in your packet. Um, there's a whole bunch of pink tabs, but if you flip through to SB um, 1453, um, the changes um, are in section E, F, and G1 and adding G2. Okay. So I was just pointing uh, to those sections as like a reference where to look. Thank you. My understanding is that SLPs are currently um, are allowed to perform this procedure. Um, I, I would like to defer to our speech pathology colleagues on the board uh, in terms of what are the limitations that they currently experience with that. Um, I have not performed it. I've been school-based, so um, I cannot make a comment about that. How about uh, Ms. Dominguez? So, um, we, we do perform these in our um, facility and we are abiding by the regulations of making sure that our speech pathologists have had at least a minimum of the 25 um, scopes observed, directly observed by the otolaryngologist um, that is board certified. Um, we have been uh, lucky to be able to have the same otolaryngologist ENT supervise um, the, the multiple members of, of our uh, team. Um, and and deem them competent to perform um, the procedure. What I think is beneficial in having the ENT present is that there is um, education that they provide to the clinicians that maybe a another um, speech pathologist may not be able to um, simply because of their scope of practice. So we do find it beneficial to um, at least have um, the guidance from the ENT uh, and get that um, education and mentorship from them. Um, I did look at the attachment from ASHA regarding the states with specific um, instrumental assessment requirements, and they did touch upon many of the requirements that were um, referenced in the American Journal for Speech Language Pathology article, that part one. Um, so forgive me if I'm going back and forth, but what I think is, is important is that we do make sure that we're protecting the, the consumer providing them um, a, a safe environment for the professionals to do this because there are risks. There are risks, again, with how you clean the scopes. You know, there have been issues with major infections um, from scopes that aren't adequately cleaned, um, as was mentioned um, before. Um, but I, I do think that uh, in the summary that, um, and I agree with the letter as well, Dr. what he mentioned, is that it, it would be a good consideration to be able to do the fees procedures uh, if it's ordered by an ENT or another physician and not just the ENT authorizing authorizing it. So allowing an order to be given for this procedure uh, to be done by us. Um, secondly, referencing the journal article, there are some recommended numbers of scopes or scopings that um, they list there, for example, um, passing on healthy patients, at least 10, um, I'm sorry, healthy um, subjects, uh, 10, and then passing on patients, which is very difficult, different from healthy uh, subjects, you know, at least uh, 15 um, under the under the supervision of a SLP or a physician. Um, so I really uh, do appreciate this this journal article obviously that has some research behind it right and and you see the ones who have um, authored this uh, well known in the community for swallowing disorders so I think it's worth 
incorporating the recommendations from that journal article into how we move forward with um, this document. Um, you know, I, I, I have been asked about, does it need to be 25 scopes supervised by a otolaryngologist? Can it be a fellow speech pathologist? And that was referenced in the article as well. And that is also referenced in some of the other states. Uh, they're saying that um, it is okay to be supervised by a speech pathologist who is skilled in performing the procedure and or the physician otolaryngologist who has knowledge and experience in these procedures. And so this is a this is a heavy um, <laughs> um, bill um, that is has is multifactorial. Um, which is great to discuss. I mean, I, I'm just excited to discuss this one, but there are many aspects of it. Um, I do think there's an educational piece that needs to be considered um, as the other states have in their assessment requirements that include attending CEEs, whether it be ASHA or whether it be internal, um, whether it be a, a full day um, or it be a two day course and then taking an exam. Um, that's written to demonstrate your um, knowledge of the procedure. I think all of it is important um, and, and needs to be, um, I guess, uh, maintained uh, for the integrity of the bill and to also protect our consumers. Can I just ask, Gilda, that are you in a medical, your practice is in a medical facility? You have yes. ENTs yes. nearby? Yes, we have okay. emergency procedures. So if we have to call a code or a, a rapid response, we have a team that would, would assist us if there was an adverse um, reaction to the procedure. Would you know if the uh, private practitioners who are considering doing this have all of the emergency backup equipment or they're, they're anticipating that they will and they know how to operate uh, a defibrillator, for example? That would be, a, 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 that's a really good question. Um, it would be suggested that they do have all, all of that in place, um, whether it be a crash cart or they have a defibrillator or if they have a physician that's readily available, maybe in the same building in an adjacent suite. Um, I believe Tennessee lists on their guidelines, if I can find it, Tennessee uh, 5B, and then um, Roman numeral um, four and then A. When they reference that the procedures performed in a community setting, such as a physician's office, the physician shall be on the premises and provide on site supervision. And then they proceed if the procedure is performed in an institutional setting, such as a hospital or nursing home, a physician shall provide general supervision that would need to be defined. Um, and be readily available in the event of emergency, including but not limited to physical presence at the institution or availability by phone. Okay, there, there we go. Um, so I, there, it looks like Tennessee has has verbiage that does address that, and that that could be considered. Well, my experience with trying to reach a physician by phone uh, is a <laughs> risky endeavor. Uh, if you need, if you need a quick emergency support, right. um, I don't know how realistic that is. I, could you talk to us about the, the reality of this? Who, who's referred out to have this procedure done by a private SLP? Um, I presume it's the physician who's ordering it. What's the likelihood that they're going to send them to some private individual to do it? Is that a common phenomenon? Well, I'm familiar with my medical setting, and that's where we receive um, referrals for patients that um, may have a diagnosis of head and neck cancers, um, for example. And we're looking at the um, vocal folds upon movement of, of oral intake and, and assessing that. Well, I'm just wondering about the need to have private SLPs performing this procedure because there's a lack of people in medical environments to do it. Is that the case? I am not sure about that. 
Um, the way I the way I was reading it was perhaps that it's not maybe not that it's not to be done in a medical facility, but maybe that medical facility doesn't have otolaryngologists. Um, I know in, in the facility I work, uh, we have that problem in some parts of the state where it's very difficult to have an ENT present. We have plenty of physicians and GPs, but we don't have ENTs at hand, and so uh, it could be a limiting factor in being able to perform this at those locations. Do they limit then where they have to go to do it at this point? They just can't? If I'm understanding this one correctly, it's currently required that an ENT be present, right? Okay, so in, in the VA facilities, they have to go to where such personnel exist? They are working on that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that too. Um, Gilda, I'd like to go back in the discussion a little bit to the um, 25 hours of training, and you mentioned that you were able to have that training through um, your, your mentor being an ENT. And the article that you referred to does talk about um, the supervision for, for that that could be in the training could be conducted by a skilled SLP or a physician. Um, uh, Dr. Um, Valdez uh, had um, said he, that it should be an ENT. I've heard some subject matter experts agree with the article saying it can be a a skilled SLP. So I wondered what your thoughts are, even though your own experience was with an ENT. I think their knowledge and their expertise is valuable for for um, mentoring us and teaching us um, this. Sorry, this did you hear at the very beginning? Could you say that again, oh, Gilda? I think I do think the mentorship and the training that we receive and the collaboration that we have with the ENTs is valuable. Many of of our patients are being seen by um, ENTs, otolaryngologists, and um, have pathologies that are, are being, whether they're treated behaviorally, medically, surgically, and we're part of that multidisciplinary team. So uh, to maintain that collaborative um, work for the safety of the, of the consumer, I think is valuable. Sure. Now, um, the, the 10, 15, 25, however that's broken up, I do think that, again, I'm going to say it, is that the ENT is, is valuable for that process, for that learning experience. Um, maybe up to the 25, maybe there's a number utilizing this, this journal article, and maybe the first 10 is observed by an otolaryngologist, just for example, and then the next 15 um, can be supervised by um, someone who has been deemed um, competent to assess the competency of others, whether that be a speech language pathologist um, that's signed off by that EN, an ENT or that, that ENT um, themselves. Um, but this article says that it's, uh, I believe it's 10 healthy and then 15 patients with dysphagia, so 10 disordered. Um, and then there is a mentor um, assessment and then there's indirect supervision. Um, again, it, it is a stated, uh, a safe procedure under the, the trained hands, but there are, are risks and also trained eyes uh, that can um, see disorders, see, see lesions, see um, aspiration. Um, you know, though, again, that's hard to see on the feet, but you know, um, um, looking at the swallow function uh, during the passing of the, the scope along with the feeding of the bolus, whether it be solids or liquids. But we didn't have, have it have an issue. We have we have a we've grown to have a great partnership with our ENT because of our collaboration on these procedures. Okay, thank you very much. But Gilda, I was just wondering if you know if there's more than one type of endoscope. Are they all the same? Uh, so there are different is, manufacturers, different manufacturers, and um, different sizes, um, different units. So you have to learn potentially more than one um, yes, piece of equipment. Yes, depending on the, yes, depending on the type of scope, uh, the way you hold it, whether it be, lack of a better term, overhand or, or with your palm facing up. Um, you know, whether you're holding it like a, a a pool cue or holding it like you're throwing a javelin, 
um, you know, there's different ways to to hold these scopes and to manipulate the camera at the end because they are flexible. Does the manufacturer provide training on how to use an autoclave? So for us, we have set up the training for that through our uh, supply processing department to make sure that we are uh, following um, those guidelines. Um, you know, we have to meet guidelines for certain accredita accrediting bodies. Um, so we have to make sure that we're, we're following through with that. So um, we're not going to be causing harm. harm. So Gilda, I have a question. Would you then say, since there's different scopes, performing 25 procedures with one type of scope, does that automate, automatically make you competent to operate a different type of scope? Or would you then need to have 25 procedures with the different scope because how you use it is not exactly the same? I don't see that that is specified when I'm reading through all these articles and, and documents per se that you have to have an additional 25 if you're utilizing a different no. type of scope. It's not, it just says 25 procedures, but if there's different scopes and you potentially may use different scopes in your practice, that would be a concern of mine. Yeah. The uh, the term readily available also generally low key freaks me out a little bit. What does that mean? Yeah. And it does say the primary goal of passing the scope on healthy volunteers is to gain technical proficiency in handling, passing, and manipulating that endoscope in order to attain um, a desired view and observe function while keeping the person comfortable. Mm -hmm. Right, but it doesn't necessarily, right. I mean, that's kind of a generalized term, though, for yes. almost as yep. if it's a generalized um, scope. Right. But not all facial tissue is Kleenex. No. Are there highly portable versions of this equipment? In other words, you know, in the bill it's reading, this allows us to go and, and take care of the patient at their most comfortable place. I mean, I'm, in my mind, I'm picturing things like, um, rehab facilities and nursing homes, et cetera, where, where maybe it might be difficult for those individuals to get to a medical center. But does that not really matter? I mean, are there not portable versions of this? Is that kind of... Maybe um, really, members of the public know. can comment on this, but I, I, I have heard that there are now um, companies that are doing portable fees or just now starting to do portable fees as there have been in the past doing portable modified barium swallow studies. Um, right. But but these these um, these units, uh, many of them do at least the ones we have come on wheels, and you can roll them through the facility. Maybe that maybe that's part of the purpose of the the bill itself is to to allow for those more portable aspects to be utilized in facilities that aren't hospitals but have patients or clients who might be difficult to to get to a medical facility for care. True. Is, can we know the sponsors? Going, oh, sorry. That's okay. Sorry. Sorry, Gil. Go ahead. And I, and I think if someone is going to a nursing home, they would have those uh, medical procedures um, readily um, available, you know, including the staff and the equipment. Um, so if it's portable, just just as modified barium swallows uh, studies were, where they had a speech pathologist and a, and a um, a physician um, come to the skilled nursing facility to do these procedures, um, I would think they would have um, a similar setup for the safety of the patients. But again, I, I haven't personally experienced um, a portable um, service for this. And there is no, no differentiation in the bill for adult versus pediatric? None, no. Would you say this is a fairly invasive procedure? Gilda? I believe it's considered invasive. We do um, have the patient, um, we do explain to the patient and um, have them have a documentation of, of um, consent for the procedure. There are risks, there are risks. You're, you're, you're going through 
the nasal cavity. And right. you're, and you're um, yeah, looking at a superior view. Right. Which is why my concern is um, that medical supervision not being someone who is specialized in the area that you happen to be invading. I mean, I, I love my GP and she's a great family doctor, but you know, unless there's some sort of assurances that this person has some sort of training to be able to deal with, you know, whatever might happen, I don't understand how that medical doctor is, you know, someone that I would feel comfortable with being able to help if there's something serious happened. Well, I think if you look at the the study in the in the article that was provided, I think of her. 7,600 cases they were looking at and, and detailing out what the possible outcomes or the risks that are, um, were experienced and uh, other than nosebleeds, you know, it was like 10 people out of 7,600 had, you know, so I, it is deemed to be, it is invasive, I would say, but it certainly appears as though it's been studied pretty extensively in terms of the risks and it seems to be minimal. So, so not thinking that a GP could handle the possible outcomes from having that procedure done maybe isn't quite right. <laughs> well, I just depends on your comfort level, I guess. But if it was 10 out of 76,000, you know, but I don't know. It's just, it's, it's an issue that I have. You know, what kind of training do they have in that area? I think uh, one thing we are considering or concerned about is that differing levels of locations have differing ideas about what emergency medical backup procedures are and and um, like hospitals that Guild is working in or a skilled nursing facility is even a higher level than a regular nursing home. And the type of backup procedures or physician's presence is different in lower level facilities, um, let alone if we're going outside of that altogether. Um, so there's that that idea and concern. Um, but the other part of protecting consumers is the um, addition of contraindications so that those that are maybe more high risk of, of these bleeding episodes or vasovagal episodes, um, th they wouldn't be doing them on those. So that's, that's also part of the, the consumer protection. So there's a little bit of, of both areas going on here. Heather, when you say it's on the Senate floor, meaning it's gone through all the committees, appropriations, everything has gone. Yeah. In the first health, correct. But it'll Stop, still need to go through the assembly, assembly. committees mm -hmm. and um, assembly appropriations. Is there any further board discussion? I'm not exactly sure what the the motion would be in this case. since. So it would really depend on the board. Um, if you like the bill as is and you're comfortable adopting a, a support position as it is, um, or if you do have concerns that should be addressed through amendments, we would need to flush out um, what those, what your top concerns are, um, and then you can delegate to board staff to um, come up with the details of what the amendments would be, but we would need um, feedback from the board on what your main concerns are and what areas you want board staff to focus on for um, proposing amendments. Heather, can you restate your rec recommendations, uh, the recommendations you stated earlier as far as- My recommendation was board discussion. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. okay. Yeah, it depends on the board how, what provisions of the bill specifically you have concerns with that you would want us to work on amendments if that's the direction you want to go or if you like the bill as is and want to move the bill forward um, as well. And, and, and just to add in there, um, you can take a pure support position, you can take a pure opposed position. If you're going to propose amendments, then what you need to decide is, is this something we want? and we'd like to see these amendments, so that would be support if amended, mm -hmm. or is this something we don't want, but if it's going to happen, we want to propose these changes, which would be opposed and less amended. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that was more helpful than not. <laughs> well, and Heather, what I was referring to is the board may want to consider um, oh, 
Uh, yes, yeah, so the points that we highlighted, it, this board staff highlighted it as main concerns are um, requesting a delayed implementation date so that we can develop regulations that would flush out the readily available, um, what emergency backup procedures are, and we can do that through the regulatory process. Um, and then clarity on the supervision and written verification requirements for speech language pathologists um, regarding the 25 required procedures and the competency. Um, because one of the things right now is it currently says it has to be one ENT, um, and we don't know if we want to make it so they can have multiple ENTs do the procedure. And then, or if we also want to consider adding in um, SLPs can be supervisors, um, we would need direction from the board on that. Um, and then a reporting requirement for any adverse events that occur during a fees procedure and inclusion of additional contraindications. Um, Dr. Valdez gave us some and um, ASHA has some in their information that I supplied as well. So we believe uh, making these changes may improve the language that currently exists because there there is some confusion with the way the the text currently reads in law. So the the proposals, uh, in addition to these amendments, we feel would clarify those requirements. So that suggests um, opposed unless amended. Either opposed unless amended or support, and yeah, just either opposed unless amended or support if amended. Like um, our legal counsel was saying, if you generally like the idea of the bill, you like expanding the fees procedure to multiple locations, um, but you have some things you want to flush out. Um, we have been working with the sponsor, Kesha, on um, some discussions, so they are open to meeting with us. We do anticipate them being willing to continue to work with us. Um, but if you don't want to make any changes to current law at all, um, but you think this is going to pass anyways, and you want to try to make it more palatable, so to speak, then you would go oppose unless amended. So oppose unless amended is just a stronger position than support if amended. Um, so it kind of is up to the board on how strongly you feel about the expanding the fees procedure in general. What discussion? It, it seems like it, it seems like um, some speech pathologists are already doing this mm -hmm. right now, right. right? Correct. Yeah, they currently can do it, but right now they're limited to the locations where they can do it. And the general premise of this bill is to expand and the locations mm -hmm. where they can do it. Okay. And uh, the supervisor that has to be there. I think right now the yes. supervisor available and in the building has to be the ENT and not just a physician. Okay. I, I believe that's been one of the biggest issues is the supervision piece. Yeah. Um, based on what I've learned here in previous reading, I think we should do a support with them um, if, if amended. I, I would agree with that. I think, you know, as much as uh, we want to protect consumers, of course, and we don't want to be expanding things that would put consumers at risk, you know, access to care is also something important to balance um, and making sure that people who need um, the treatment or need the test run have access to that as well in a safe way. True. I agree. I agree with that. Can I just clarify something that's unclear to me? I understand about the 25 procedures and those are supervised. Is there additional required training to to do this procedure? No. So there's nothing in any academic program that shows no. you how to do this? No, but in the, um, what Ms. Dominguez was referring to in the um, ASHA publication that is included in here, um, they do outline um, a process for certifying or to making sure people are, um, there's a whole bunch of steps and one of the steps is attending a ASHA CE approved external fees course um, and then they talk about the um, taking an exam and practicing on the healthy volunteers before you work on patients. Um, so, 
I mean, that is something if the board likes this process, that is something we can talk to Kesha if they would be open to. Um, That's a just a recommendation at this point from Ash. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but if the board chooses to want to follow that pro step process, I mean, it, it's your, it's up to the board what you want to see um, this procedure look like and what you want the training and the competency to look like. And this is pretty recent. This is really recent, um, a recent journal article. Um, and Susan Langmore is well respected in this field. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it, it makes it makes um, sense to look at the supervision piece and and the location where that these can be um, performed safely. I I like having a physician nearby, somewhere in the building, just in case. I like being able to have the the availability of a a team who can assist if you know the patient faints. Could I ask our speech colleagues here if dysphagia work is generally done or can be also done in a private clinic or even in a home as opposed to a hospital? I think of that as kind of equally invasive um, or requires great skill to not endanger. Again, I'm deferring to go ahead. <laughs> Gilda, do you know that? In, in the home, I have I have not um, personally heard of fees being done in a in a private no, home. No, not in fees, place. but oh. dysphagia. Yes, yes. There, I mean, yes. The we, swallow evaluations are done, for example, in home health and skilled nursing, um, along with you know diet modifications, and and those speech therapists do make recommendations for whether it be further instrumentation such as modify brain swallow or fees. Um, so th there is therapy that is done in the home, but it's um, not invasive. Okay, I mean, if there are, if they're doing that already, it, it has its complications and aspirations, fears and things like that as well. So how are we feeling about the support of amended? No, uh, are we, approach? before we, are we supposed to um, see if there's any comments from Kasha or uh, after we after we do that we have a motion motion oh, okay hmm. I I actually would are we okay with um, what Holly mentioned um, support if amended that's what I'm asking oh, okay how do you feel yeah okay so do you want to formulate I think we're we're all on board with so that there's there's some things that I've heard come up in discussion that I wanted to ask. Uh, Ms. Dominguez mentioned she does like to have a physician on site, um, but one of the provisions of this bill is to make it so that a physician um, doesn't need to be present um, if the other requirements are met with the um, 25. Um, but she was saying in the building now, right, available. Okay. She? Um, part of the emergency yeah, procedure. I think that yeah. What? Yeah. 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 I was going to say, we couldn't hear you, Gilda. Can you say it again? I'm sorry. In the building, not directly supervising once you're once you're cleared. Well, I think that's one of the things we need to see amended is what is readily available mean. I think that needs to be more specifically defined. Does that mean within a 10 minute drive or in a building? Pardon? Yes. Yeah. So, are we ready to for a motion? Um, so, um, what we would recommend, um, if you're in agreement of all our areas that board staff um, thinks needs to be clarified, it would be: I move that the board adopt a support if amended position and delegate to the executive officer or their delegate to request of and negotiate amendments to the bill with the author and sponsor in order to achieve a reasonably delayed implementation date so that the regulations can be clarified through regulations, 
Oh, sorry. So that the bill could be clarified through regulations. Clarity on the supervision and written verification requirements for the speech language pathologist 25 required procedures and competence to perform these procedures. A reporting requirement for adverse events that occur during a fees procedure and inclusion of additional contraindications identified during the meeting. I so move. Okay. I think it was second. But you move. Oh. Oh, that was my. Yep. I didn't hear the. Mo I didn't hear somebody. Uh, Ms. Dominguez made the motion, so moved. So okay. that, that okay. the motion um, language that Ms. Oliveris read. Any discussion here in the room? Any public members who want to discuss it? Here, seeing none, uh, can we open up for public comment uh, via WebEx? We are open for public comment via WebEx. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial-in dial -in users may dial star 3 to raise their hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. And we have a request from Laura Wasco. Bear with us just a moment, please, and we will send you a request to unmute your microphone. Laura, we have sent you a request to unmute your microphone. We're going to send you a second one. All right, let's move on to Jennifer and we'll circle back to Laura in just a moment. Jennifer Kisner, we're sending you a request to unmute your microphone. And I see that Laura has unmuted. It took a little <laughs> while to pop up. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. My name is Laura Wasco and I'm with the Ball Frost Group representing the California Speech Language Hearing Association, otherwise known as CASHA. And CASHA is the sponsor of SB 1453. And I want to thank the board and staff for the very um, informative and um, positive discussion around this area. Um, as you can tell, there is a lot of confusion in the field um, regarding this section of law. And our goal with SB 1453 is to clarify that in statute for speech and language therapists to be eligible to perform the fees procedure and further clarify the locations in which these procedures can be conducted. Um, the calls for fees has, um, in multiple different settings, has increased substantially due to COVID, and we're seeing the need increasing, and our SLPs are doing them at a much more frequent number in, in all types of settings. Um, the clarifications provided by SB 1453 means that more patients can receive these services in the area and best um, setting for to meet their medical and physical needs. Um, we respect, respectfully ask for the board to take a support position on SB 1453. And as I know you are suggesting a number of amendments, we look forward to working with you. Um, we also wanted to take the opportunity to thank the executive director, Paul and staff for working with us on the bill so far. And we um, look forward to continue this partnership on the important issues. I know Jennifer is also on the line and she's going to hit some of the key points as a um, SLP practicing in the field, doing a number of these procedures um, at her location. So thank you. Okay, let's circle back to Jennifer. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. 
Okay, so um, thank you so much for this opportunity um, to talk to you. My name is Jennifer Kisner. I'm a speech language pathologist um, and clinical specialist at Stanford Healthcare in the Head and Neck Oncology Clinic. And um, I've been performing fees for the last 15 plus years. I probably do anywhere between one and six a day. Um, I just wanted to just give a kind of brief overview again. I know there's been a lot of talk about what it is, but fees is a procedure that has been established back in the late 1980s by Susan Langmore and colleagues as a method for objectively evaluating swallowing function. And it's currently used as a standard clinical tool worldwide. The examination requires a skilled clinician to pass a very small diameter scope through the nose in order to visualize the throat. Once the scope is passed through the nose, the speech pathologist provides the patient with food and liquid mixed with a colored contrast in order to objectively evaluate both the safety and efficiency of their swallowing function and also to make appropriate dietary recommendations. Uh, the fees examination is a low risk procedure and can be performed in any medical environment where the patient is located to objectively evaluate swallowing and patients who benefit from this examination really vary widely from pediatrics through geriatrics and across multiple disorders such as stroke, brain injury, head neck cancer, and most recently uh, with patients who are dealing with swallowing issues related to COVID-19. Um, and I also have my board certification in swallowing and swallowing disorders for the last 22 years, and I'm happy to answer any uh, clinical questions if you have them. Thank you. Is there any radiology involved in this um, procedure? No, uh, radiologists uh, assist us with the modified barium swallow study, which is the second objective swallowing study that we have. Fees and modified barium swallow studies are the two most widely used uh, swallow evaluations. I guess since you're so experienced with this, um, how do you manage um, people with, uh, you know, contraindicated situations? Do you take them on anyway because you have an ENT nearby? You're, you're in the seat of, uh, you know, otolaryngology expertise. So what happens when a, a problem has occurred? Surely something has to happen. It has happened in the last 15 years. Yeah, so it's interesting because I actually teach a fees course at Stanford. My next one is coming up in a month where we do a two day course where we show people how to do fees and then we have otolaryngologists present so that they can get their practice passes, um, start to get those passes, which typically is what folks do. Um, in my 15 years of doing fees, I've had um, a couple of nosebleeds um, and maybe a vasovagal or two, nothing that required the patient to have a higher, to be transferred to a higher level of care. Everything was able to be um, treated within the setting. Um, there are, besides the ENTs, we have fabulous APPs, our advanced practice pr practitioners, which are nurse practitioners and physician assistants who are also um, within our hospital and clinics, but I know they also uh, are in skilled nursing facilities and rehabilitation centers. So any um, medical setting will have emergency medical backup plans. So if something happens, even if, if it's a, someone passes out or someone falls, you know, during physical therapy, we have our emergency backup plans within the facility. Um, I don't, I'm sure they're sort of universal, but there's standard work around if this happens, you do this, you call this number, you call this person. Um, and I think that in a skilled hands, fees is really a very low risk procedure. Um, we are not, you know, puncturing through any orifice. We are going through natural openings in the nose and we're just peeking down into the throat. The endoscope probably goes two inches. That's all it needs to go into the nose, to the back of the throat, and then the end of the scope, um, the head of the scope moves, it articulates up and down so that you can get a good image of the throat. Um, I, I understand the concerns about um, wanting the patients to be safe, and I come from a big patient advocacy background where I want the patients to be um, effectively 
evaluated for their swallowing so that someone doesn't sit with a feeding tube for long periods of time because nobody was able to do the swallowing test. And it happens over and over. So being able to timely, in a timely manner, evaluate someone's swallow, it's, it's all about their quality of life and getting them back to eating. So I think why we wanted this bill, the amendment to this bill was so that in skilled hands, that we would be able to offer this procedure, not just in a hospital setting, but in other medical environments where patients need the test. And unfortunately, some of them have to wait weeks and weeks in order to get an appointment in a facility. So um, I'm really just advocating for patients to get the right procedure at the right time so that we can move their health care forward. Are you comfortable with a private practitioner doing this in their in their office? I would I would want to know what medical procedures they have. You know, I have worked at Stanford Hospital for 22 years, and so I've always been in a, a medical environment. Um, I'd want to know what their I want, would want to know what their um, backup procedures would be. Did you say are you actually training residents? I train speech pathologists um, on how to do uh, fees, and uh, in my course that I do, I work with my Stanford laryngologists and um, speech pathologists who are trained, and we get a group of people for two days, and we do the didactic portion, and then we do hands-on portion. Uh, uh, Ms. Kisner, I'm just curious, uh, you've said medical environments and medical facilities, so I presume that might also um, not be or maybe you would have more concerns about medical backup procedures in community facilities, um, such as lower, um, lower care level nursing homes that are community care licensed. I would say the skilled nursing facility should be able to have the appropriate medical backup. Um, for this for this low risk procedure. And there's there are multiple studies that really when when you say adverse reactions, um, they really are, you know, a vasovagal or a nosebleed. And I think in the right for the, with the skilled clinician, you know, even if I get an order from a physician to do a fees, I still need to go to that patient and do my own assessment to see if they're appropriate at that moment to do it. So if they're, you know, delirious or they're on medication or there's some reason that they're not appropriate, they can't follow directions or don't understand what I'm doing, um, or maybe the doctor didn't know that they've, you know, they have, you know, broken their nose in multiple places and it's hard to pass the scope. So even with the order, I still go in and do my evaluation to make sure that, that this is the right test for this patient at this time. Um, I, I'd like your, your opinion on whether the 25 um, uh, procedures need to be trained by um, an uh, 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 otolaryngologist versus a highly skilled uh, SLP such as yourself. Um, thank you, Holly. I think that um, what we really need the laryngologist uh, for is to, to safely show people how to pass a scope. I think the actual examination of giving food and liquid trials and doing um, compensatory strategy training, my laryngologist doesn't know that because that's my field of expertise. So that what the laryngologist really is you know, showing that, yes, this person can safely pass a scope. They know the anatomy and physiology of, you know, from the nasopharynx down to the glottis. And, but they're not, um, I don't think that they're all appropriate to pass someone for doing the procedure because it really is a speech pathologist procedure to do, if that makes sense. Thank you. Is there any other public comment from WebEx? <clears throat> we
we have a request from Kenya Gomez. Hold on just a moment, please. And we will send your request to unmute your microphone. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Kenya Gomez Tidor calling from Emanate Health in um, West Covina. Um, wanted to just kind of give some input on um, how we handle fees in our organization. We are a three tiered um, hospital system where we have an acute rehab unit, uh, multiple um, inpatient acute units, a transitional care unit, and an outpatient unit. And we do perform fees in all of these areas. Um, we do have the advantage that our outpatient units are attached to the hospital. So those emergency medical um, procedures are, are readily available. Um, I know that we were talking about um, the training. Um, we have 20 speech pathologists under our, our um, team and we work very, very much in conjunction with the um, otolaryngologist for training of our fees procedures. However, we do have um, very seasoned clinicians who assist um, on just troubleshooting and consulting with our newer clinicians. Um, they do undergo um, training through a program very similar to Stanford's um, where they would go in with, um, you know, hands-on training as well as um, some lectures so that they can be well-versed in, in the anatomy and, and the procedure. So I just kind of uh, wanted to um, answer any questions or just kind of um, advocate for the procedure. I think it is a, a great diagnostic tool. I think, you know, as the, the field gets a little older, we're, we're really getting into that evidence-based um, and objective measures of swallowing. And, and this is just such a great tool, especially we um, during COVID, we really saw the long-term um, uh, vent patients, um, long-term ICU patients, and this was just a wonderful tool for those patients who can't be moved into the radiology suite for the video fluoros. And those are all our requests for public comment through WebEx at the moment. Okay, I'd like to thank everyone for their public comments. Those were very helpful. Um, can we ask if Gilda has any public input? Uh, there is no one else here with me for public comment. Okay, if there's no further board discuss discussion, I'd like to um, ask Sharice to call the vote. Dr. Raggio. Aye. Ms. Kaiser. Aye. Mr. Borges. Aye. Ms. Chang. Aye. Ms. Dominguez. Aye. Ms. Snow. Aye. Dr. White. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, the next bill um, on my list is AB22. Um, this is regarding veterans and military spouses. Um, this bill has not been scheduled in the Senate Business Professions and Economic Development Committee. Um, the board currently has a position of opposed unless amended. This bill would expand current law requiring a temporary license for applicants currently licensed in another state who are married to or in a domestic partnership with an active duty member of the military currently stationed in California to also apply to applicants who are veterans within 60 months of separation and active duty members with official separation orders within 90 days. There is currently a provision in the bill that would remove the um, current provision that allows a temporary license to expire upon the denial of an application for a permanent license. Um, the board's opposition is just specifically to that provision. Um, if this bill moves forward, we will continue to advocate for that amendment um, and then be able to remove our opposition to the bill. Um, the next bill is AB 1662, 
licensing board's disqualification from licensure for criminal convictions. This bill has not been scheduled in the Assembly Appropriations Committee. The board currently has an opposed unless amended position. However, the bill has been amended since the board um, adopted that position. Um, this bill would now require boards to establish a process for prospective applicants to request a pre-application determination whether they may be disqualified from licensure based on their criminal history. The board may require prospective applicants to furnish fingerprints to conduct a criminal history record check. The board must notify the prospective applicant in writing if their criminal history could be cause for denial and include information regarding the criteria for substantially related crimes, the process to request a copy of the complete conviction history, notification of the right to appeal the board's decision, and the rehabilitation criteria established by the board. This bill would authorize the board to charge a fee of up to $50 for this pre-application determination. Board staff are, is recommending that the board move to an opposed position um, based on the current direction of the bill. Although the bill would allow the board to charge a $50 fee for this determination, this fee would not fully recoup the board's costs. This bill would significantly increase the board's workload to review potential applicants' criminal history records and make a predetermination whether they may be disqualified from licensure based on their criminal history. Additionally, this bill would require the board to develop a number of new procedures, including the process for the including the process for requesting a pre-application determination, the process to provide the potential applicant with their complete conviction history, and a, very, a potentially very costly appeal process. Does anyone have any questions? So is the predetermination, I mean, the, they ask for a predetermination and you come back and say you may be disqualified. Would they then go back and apply anyway with the hopes they won't be disqualified? Is that the idea here? You're actually having to do this check twice? No, so the idea is um, people who have criminal history would ask for this predetermination prior to starting a training program. Um, this is more geared towards um, like if there's a lot of education required to um, enter that field um, and they want to know before they spend all the money going to school basically um, if they would be disqualified. Um, but the way the bill is currently going is it's adding um, an appeal process and it's not really clear how they would be able to appeal a predetermination. Um, and it's almost like that we may have to, if they get this predetermination when they finish school and apply, we may have to honor if they, you know, based on the outcome of that appeal. It's not really clear um, the way the bill is currently written what would happen after the predetermination was made. So I'm going to go ahead and chime in here. I mean, the bill is not clear, and then there's the potential that it could be the costly route that current applicants have when we deny them. They can appeal all the way through the administrative hearing um, appeal process. So that becomes extremely costly, all for a predetermination. Um, there's many questions of how many people this actually applies to. Um, oftentimes, uh, sometimes we see criminal convictions that are from um, earlier on, sometimes we're seeing them within the last couple years while they were getting the education that this so-called predetermination is supposed to be prior to. So um, there's a lot of um, vagueness and, and gray area on this one on top of if it does mean the, the official Office of Administrative Hearings and that sort of administrative appeal route, that could be very costly. And we currently have an opposed position and we don't have any reason to recommend anything different at this point. No, we currently have an opposed unless amended. Okay. And we're recommending going to a straight opposed. Only because like what our concerns were, originally when we were opposed unless amended, the bill was didn't include all of this appeal information. 
um, and our concerns were regarding the fingerprinting and um, wanting to be able to charge a fee. They amended it to now require fingerprinting, so that addressed that concern, and then they did put in a fee, but they determined what the fee is rather than us being able to determine what the fee is based on our actual workload. Um, so now at this time, we're just recommending to go um, strictly to an opposed position. So they amended it the wrong direction? <laughs> they amended it <laughs> with what we wanted, but then added other stuff that isn't so great. Well, that'll show you. <laughs> Any other board discussion? Um, I ask can, we can make the same motion for oh, one is opposed, one is opposed if amended unless amended under the same motion? So the currently on this bill where it says current board position, we currently are opposed unless amended. And I submitted a letter and I communicated with the author staff what amendments we wanted to see to the initial version of the bill. They did take those amendments, um, but then they added in all of this information about the appeal that we still have concerns with and in contacts with them, they're no longer communicating with our office, um, which is why we want to move to just an opposed. Yeah, no, I understand. I'm just wondering if we're at this point, both uh, AB 225 and 6, 1662 are under the same motion. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we don't I, need to do anything to AB 225. We don't need to change our position. So we would only need a motion that would say the board is adopting an oppose on AB 16 if, if we wanted to change our position, okay. then we would need a motion to change our position. Correct. Okay, so that's all we're dealing with here. Okay. Yeah, um, AB 225, there's no change. So I don't believe we need to have public comment, correct? Because we're not changing anything? No. Okay. We can do public comment at the end of the report if there's comment on other bills. Okay. okay. Would you like to formulate? Our, our uh, motion. So the board adopts an opposed position on AB 1662. I, sorry, I, I move that we oppose unless amended AB 1662. Just oppose. Oh, I'm sorry, that we want to change it to oppose. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry, um, I'd like to move that we change our position to oppose on AB 1662. Excuse me. Second. Is there any public comment in the, um, in the room? If not, I would like to move to pu any public comment uh, via WebEx. We are now accepting public comment on WebEx. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial-in users may dial star 3 to raise their hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests for comments. Let's take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. And while we are waiting, um, since it doesn't look like we are going to get any, I would like to step out of the role of moderator for just a moment and make a comment for myself. Um, my name is David. I work for the Department of Consumer Affairs and have worked for DCA for well over 10 years. Um, I have written many letters on behalf of uh, various boards and bureaus uh, to people, encouraging them to apply because uh, the board was unwilling to state whether a uh, uh, a candidate could qualify or not, even though there are, in some cases, very clear instances where a candidate has no opportunity to become licensed in the profession they're tr they're inquiring about, and uh, I think this bill was designed to take on uh, those specific cases and find uh, a way to tell them that they do not need to apply because there's no way that they would ever get a chance to become licensed. Um, that being said, I think, I think that this bill is uh, 
taking an opposed position on this bill is the correct decision. And with that, we still don't have any other requests for public comment uh, from WebEx. Shall we move to Ms. Dominguez? Yes, if we should move to the other side. Yes, please. There is no one else present with me for public comment. Sure. Sure. If, there's, if there's no further um, board discussion, I'd like to ask Teresa to call the vote. <clears throat> Dr. Raggio. Aye. Ms. Kaiser. Aye. Mr. Borges. Aye. Ms. Chang. Aye. Ms. Dominguez. Aye. Ms. Snow. Aye. Dr. White. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, next up I have a number of watch bills and I don't know if the board would like me to go over all of them one by one or if you just want to review and you, I'm happy to ask any questions. Um, it's up to the board. Um, may I request a quick health break? Oh. Quick break. I did. I might recommend um, if, if nobody has any questions for Ms. Olivares, you also could take a break and then excuse everyone. I, I don't know if anybody does have any questions. They're all just watch status. There's nothing. Yeah, they're all just things that we're watching on. I know. We, we can certainly that take a break when we come back. I think we, we need to take public comment on the whole report based on the other bills that are under the watch column. So. I'm sorry, I can do that. We, we can take a break, but when we come back, I think we would have to get back into the item, see if there's any other um, board discussion, take public comment, and then move. Okay, okay. So are we in recess? Five minutes. Five minutes. Sure. Sure. Can we go back to item 13D? Sure. Would you like me to go over all of the watch bills? Um, is there anything brief you can, you can do, or if they take long explanations, we probably already I don't surely already done it. I don't think we have to go over. We just want to know if there's any questions or comments. Yeah. That would require remembering you. Okay, not seeing any board discussion. Is there any public comment uh, from via WebEx? We are once again open for public comment via WebEx. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial in users may dial star three to raise their hand. And we will call on people in the order we have requests for comment. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, would you like to move to Ms. Dominguez? Yes, please. There is no one present with me for public comment. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll move on to uh, agenda item number 14 then. Legislative items for future meetings. I do not have any additional items at this time, um, but we can ask for any items from board and uh, fellow public as well. Is it legitimate if, if we don't think of something right now, but something comes up in the next two weeks that we can certainly Revisit. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, any board member can email either to Paul, Sharice, or myself any bills um, that you'd like us to take a look at, and I'm happy to bring them to a future board meeting. Okay. Is there any uh, any board discussion on future items? Seeing none, any um, public members in the audience who would like to discuss this? Seeing none, I would like to open the WebEx for public comment on future items. Uh, 
<coughs> legislative items. We are now accepting public comment on future legislative items. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star three to raise your hand and we will call on people in the order we have requests. We're gonna take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment from WebEx, would you like to move to Ms. Dominguez? Yes, please. There is no one present here with me for public comment. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Heather, for all, all your work and, and explaining. We appreciate that. Uh, let's move to agenda item 15, future agenda items. Um, is there anything that board staff would like to uh, mention at this point about future agenda items? Uh, hearing none, um, we'd like to open up WebEx for public comment on uh, future agenda items. We are once again open for public comment, this time on future agenda items. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial in users may dial star three to raise their hand and we will call on people in the order we have requests. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment in WebEx, would you like to move to Ms. Dominguez? Yes, please. There is no one else present with me for public comment. Okay, thank you. Um, we're now going to move into closed session. Um, we're going to be discussing disciplinary matters and we'll adjourn the meeting from closed session. Uh, so the meeting is now closed to the public in all locations.